I was supposed to be going shopping today for fresh vegetables and general provisions. Unfortunately, that's not possible because of the road conditions. It's a combination of floods everywhere and icy road conditions. I'm sure the roads are actually passable, but I'm just going to leave it for now. That does mean that I have to adapt my plans a little bit, and we'll try and make a meal out of what we already have in the house. Now my cupboards are usually pretty well stocked anyway, so this is not a case of us scraping around and finding the last of everything, but I'm going to have to just improvise something based on what we've got left. So we've got a bunch of vegetables here, we've got a piece of celeriac, we've got some onion, celery, a rather wrinkly and sad looking orange pepper, but it will be fine. Some mushrooms, carrots, parsnips, and from the freezer I had some portions of chicken here. I've got three thigh portions and one drumstick. I'm going to make a kind of big batch of chicken stew soup type of stuff. This is all going to go in my combination pressure cooker, slow cooker, which I really love actually and been using a lot lately. I only had this about a month, but I really love it. You could do this in a slow cooker. You could do it in a big pot over a slow gas flame. You could do it in a big pot in the oven. So there's lots of different options for doing this. I happen to be using a pressure cooker because it's fast and relatively economical, but you could do this in anything that will cook things. The idea is to keep this as simple as possible and there is no browning. So it's just going to be chicken goes straight in. Onions, I'm just going to chop into smallish dice and straight in a pot. Three sticks of celery, again, just chopped into small pieces. Carrots and parsnips just cut into... Well, my sizing criteria here is basically what's going to work on my spoon. Celeriac, a lovely winter vegetable, related to celery, but a root vegetable. Really tasty. It's kind of nutty and earthy. If you've never tried it and you like parsnips, you should probably give it a go. My orange pepper cut into quite small pieces. Now, if you think it's kind of weird that I'm using a pepper that's slightly past its best, don't worry about that. In fact, sometimes a pepper that's slightly overripe is the best one to use for a stew or a casserole because it's got maximum sweetness. If I was choosing a pepper for a salad, obviously I'd want something really fresh and crisp. But for a stew or a soup, a pepper that's a little bit wrinkly and soft, as long as it's not rotten, they've often got more flavour and depth than the fresh, crisp examples. And then a few mushrooms, which I've just hacked up into smallish pieces. Now I had a bit of a rummage in the cupboards, and I've got some peeled wheat. You could use pearl barley here, very similar sort of idea. This is just wheat grains that have been dehusked. I got this in the Turkish shop. I'm going to throw in about a handful of that. And then red split lentils. I'm getting low on these now. This is one of the things I was going to buy when I went shopping. Again, about a handful of those. And no, I'm not washing them. A chicken stock cube, which is going to give me all the salt I need for this dish, as well as obviously some extra flavour. Some of the last of the dried herbs that I brought from the old house. These are my home dried garden herbs. A little dash of Worcestershire sauce, because why not? That's going to add a bit of savoury flavour, a tiny bit of acidity. I think that'll go all right. And then garlic powder, which is... Well, I probably need to get some fresh garlic powder. This has gone a bit clumpy in my not-so-dry kitchen, but it is still usable. It hasn't gone off. And then I'm just going to cover that with water up to hopefully no higher than the maximum fill level. Now it needs a little bit more liquid in there. White wine would be great, except Jenny can't have white wine because of sulfites in it. I'm going to put some pale ale in there. About half of that bottle. Of course it wouldn't do to be not tasting a little bit of this. Probably ever so slightly hoppy and bitter for a dish like this, so I'm glad I didn't put the whole bottle in, but it's actually got a really nice malty flavour. That's a really nice, crisp, refreshing ale with prominent grain flavours and good hops. So just going to give that a little jiggle around just to make sure everything is submerged and just to check that there is enough liquid there to hydrate those grains and lentils. There definitely is. The whole concept of this is basically I've thrown whatever I've got in a pot and I've added some flavours that I think will go with it. Also, there's no browning, there's no long preparation. If I didn't have to be setting up cameras here, I could probably have thrown this together in about 10 minutes. So this is kind of trying to economise by 
using up what I've got, but also economise by not wasting too much time putting it together. So, lid on, and we'll cook that on the stew setting, which I think will cook for about 40 minutes in the pressure cooker. As I say, you could do that in a slow cooker. It would take the six hours that it takes in a slow cooker. You could do it in a pot on the hob. It'd probably take about an hour and a half, maybe two hours on the cooktop. Or you could do it in a casserole dish in the oven. And again, depending on how hot you have it and so on, you will get different flavors if you cook it in an oven or a slow cooker because the longer, hotter cooking time will caramelize some things and it will develop some flavors. What I'm hopefully gonna get out of this process is quite a fresh taste. Also gonna make some bread to go with our soup. And I don't have any bread flour, but I have plain flour, which is uh, all purpose flour. And I have some wholemeal flour. So I'm gonna put in about 100 grams of the wholemeal and make it up to 500 grams with just regular plain flour. There we go. I'll have a nice pinch of salt in there and then a sachet of yeast. Now obviously, if I didn't have yeast, I'd be looking for some kind of soda bread recipe, but I do happen to have yeast in, so that's good. So just one little sachet of instant yeast. Give that a stir. We will have a bit of oil in there bit of vegetable oil. Not strictly necessary, but it, uh, with a, with this flour, that will help to make it a softer crumb. It will inhibit the yeast a little bit, but not so far as it makes a problem. Okay, so that's 500 grams of flour in there. We're gonna go for 300 grams of water, or 300 ml of water. Okay, 300 ml of water. That kettle was boiled for coffee this morning. The water is just tepid. It's not hot at all. If it was uncomfortable to put my finger in, it would be unwise to add it to the blend because it would kill the yeast, but it's just warm. And no ceremony or anything here. That just all goes in there. And then I'll have a little dig right down to the bottom first to try and pick up the flour that's at the bottom, let the liquid go all the way down there. I'm just gonna mix until there's no dry flour. I'm not gonna knead. You can do a little bit of kneading later, but kneading is largely unnecessary for this bread. Okay, that's plenty enough mixing. So that is now just gonna go and sit in a warm place for an hour to for the flour to hydrate and for the yeast to start to work. Pressure cooker is at the end of its cycle. In fact, I had this on natural pressure release. It has an option not to vent the pressure at the end of cooking, but just kind of let it subside naturally. And that actually gets you like an extra half hour of pressure cooking for free, which for something like this soup is ideal. So let's have a look. And that chicken is gonna be falling apart. I'm just gonna have a little taste of the broth. Oh, that's really good. Right, so I'm just gonna let that cool enough that I can get hold of the rim of this pot. Then we're gonna take that out and pick the chicken off the bones and put it back in the soup. Meanwhile, my bread is ready for kneading. This bread's been proving in the warm cupboard where the hot water cylinder lives, and it's proved really fast. It's more than doubled in size, which is great. So I'm just gonna turn that out onto a floured surface and give it a little knead. It's not gonna require very much kneading. So also, just a little bit of flour on top. And yeah, you can see there's still some lumps of flour to combine in. There's still some dryish clumps that need to work in. But I don't think that'll be a problem. I'm just gonna give it the minimum of kneading. Now, if you wanted to start this bread in the morning and then go out for the day, you could just leave it in a cool place and it would do that proving in six to eight hours. So you could start this off in the morning, go out and do something, and then come back to a dough that's proved and perhaps almost ready to have its second kneading and it's baking. So that's starting to come together. Right, I'm gonna stop there. That's all the kneading I'm gonna do. And I'm just gonna divide that dough into 
three more or less equal pieces. A little bit of oil on a tray. And then these pieces of dough, I'm just going to roll them between my hands like this to create sort of long sausage shapes. Doesn't need to be particularly neat. We're going to go for something a little bit rustic anyway here. Just stretch those out a little bit. And you know, there's no particular reason to do this except that it looks nice. It will create some crust that's got a little bit more interesting shape to it and a few more little crannies to get toasty. So we're just going to give each one of these pieces of bread a turn in the middle and then press those ends together and tuck that under. And the same at that end, we'll just tuck that untidy end under. I'll cover it with a bit of oiled cling film. It can go back in the cupboard until, again, it's come back up and doubled in size. Now, this chicken soup has cooled to the point where it's still boiling hot, but the rim of the pan is handleable. I'm gonna carefully retrieve those chicken portions. They will be, at this point, falling apart. So I'll probably end up taking some vegetables with them, but that's not a problem. Okay, that's the chicken. I'm just going to have a little fish around in there just to make sure I haven't left a bone or anything like that lurking at the bottom. It looks good. So we'll set that aside and just let that cool enough to handle it. Now this chicken's still quite hot, so I'm going to use tongs to save my fingers. And I'm just going to pick off chicken into one direction, bones and skin into the other. If I'd let this cool completely, obviously that would be a whole lot easier. Now this skin and these bones, you could theoretically run that through another process where you get some stock, make some stock out of it. But we've kind of done that already by virtue of cooking it in this broth. So quality and flavour that you'll get from it is not great. I'm going to choose to stop there and these will go in the municipal food waste, which goes off and gets composted. I think we'll have a separate little dish for the bits I'm saving for Eva. Now chicken bones, not a great idea to give cooked bones to dogs because they can cause all sorts of issues with them, with their digestive system. So common wisdom is not to give cooked bones to dogs. So I will adhere to that. So quite a lot of chicken on those little thighs and that drumstick quite a good amount of chicken when it's all broken down like this and of course when it's distributed in a soup a little bit of chicken goes quite a long way okay just gonna make sure I haven't left any little bones in there sometimes on the end of a drumstick you get a little kind of knuckle thing don't seem to have done that so that lot's gonna go back in straight back into the stew pot that I'm going to just wait, and when it's cooled a little bit, I'll break it up just to make sure, just to double check it for bones, and then that'll go back in the stew pot as well. So now this chicken's cooled down a little bit, I'm just going to tear it into little shreds and drop it back in. And I will just take off any little weird gummy bits while I'm at it. Eva can have those. I'm not trying to break it up completely into fibres, I'm just going to kind of rip it into pieces that will fit in a spoon. And it's beautifully tender. And what we've made here is easily enough chicken stew, soup, whatever you want to call it, for six people. With that nice loaf of bread, which is going to go in the oven in just a moment. So I'm going to freeze some of this soup. I'm going to have some of it this evening. And you could even bulk this up further by adding pasta to it. Potatoes. I didn't put potatoes in because in the pressure cooker they tend to disappear down to nothing. But you could add potatoes to it now. You could serve it over some rice. You could, like we're going to do, have it with bread. So there we go, a decent amount of chicken soup and it's it's really hearty soup, look at that. All of these little blobs of fat on here are from the chicken. This is chicken fat, which I'm not bo gonna bother to skim that off, that's flavor. So let's just serve up a little portion of this now and see what it's like. It's really tasty. It's got that kind of stickiness that you get from chicken stock, so we definitely have cooked some of the goodness of those bones out into the broth. 
The vegetables are wonderfully tender. I do think that beer was a good idea. It's added tremendous depth to the flavor. So that's the soup, really good. I'm just gonna batch that out now. So to batch out this soup, some of it can go directly into the pan that we're gonna use for reheating it this evening. So I'll just put kind of two portions, two servings of soup, enough for me and Jenny, into that pan there. In this container, I will put probably about the same amount again. And this will go in the freezer. And then we can just thaw that and reheat it. And we just want a nice, quick and easy lunch. And then the bit that's left, which is probably another serving and a half, I'll just put in this box here. There would have been two servings if I hadn't had that bold taste. That I think I'll just put in the fridge. And that could be tomorrow's lunch. Right, look at this bread. It's risen really nicely. Just carefully remove that film. Now, it hasn't retained the, the same kind of definition that you would get with a slightly drier dough and if you did use bread flour. If you use a higher gluten flour and, of course, if you weren't so lazy and needed for a bit longer, it would have retained its definition a bit better. But you know what? I don't really care. I'm just going to brush it with some water. Just plain water. Just to moisten the top. That will serve two purposes. Firstly, it will keep the crust supple to allow it to rise even more before it actually bakes firm. But also it will hopefully just dissolve some of those surface sugars and starches that are present in the flour or metabolites of the yeast. And that will give us a nice brown crust. Into the oven now at gas mark six, which is about 200 Celsius for probably 35 to 40 minutes. All right, not a bad looking loaf of bread, I'd say. Okay, dinner time in a moment. The soup is just warming up on the stove. Let's have a look at, or perhaps a listen to this bread. And it's a lovely light, partly wholemeal loaf of bread. I'll taste a little bit now. But yeah, you can see, even though that was made with just ordinary flour, not bread flour, if it's consumed on the day of baking or the day after as toast, perfectly serviceable bread. That tastes really good. Okay, so soup and bread and butter for dinner. The supremely low effort of this is kind of contrasted by the enormous flavor in the soup and the satisfaction of having made some lovely soft bread. Early the following morning, so the bread overnight has gone a little bit stiffer and it doesn't keep as fresh when you make it with plain flour rather than bread flour. But for one thing, inside the loaf, it's still lovely and soft. The other thing is, this will be perfect for toasting. Just the very lightest toasting to bring it back to life. Butter's so cold I had to slice it. But fortunately that kind of fits my preference for toast and marmite anyway. I mean, marmite, even the marmite is cold and syrupy. But, the bread, really nice. So, a bit of a makeshift video because a bit of a makeshift situation. But I hope that was interesting. Thanks for watching and I hope to see you again soon.